All right, why don't you open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 2, and we'll jump into God's Word this morning. I'm excited about that. We are three weeks into a series called A King and a Kingdom, which has been wonderful to jump into Mark's gospel and talk about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, We are looking at a literary genre called gospel, which is kind of a new genre. And over the next few months, we'll we'll see stories that confront us, stories that offer hope, that offer healing, and even raise some questions for us. And why do we do this? Because I believe the stories are true and they're helpful for our lives. And, and these things that, that Mark's gospel talk about really happen. And if they really happen, they should challenge us and they should make us think twice about the way we live our own lives. And, and then if we think if these stories are actually true, then Christianity is really true. And Christianity is not something that we can just add on to our life if we really believe what Mark says about who Jesus is and what he's done. It's not like a gym membership. It's not like a membership to a club. It's not like a new way of living or an attempt to get healthy like you're a a CrossFit person or something like that. Although you people are intense. If you're CrossFit people, that's pretty intense. So I don't know. Maybe that's that's more of a lifestyle too, I suppose. But being a Christian means that you are a worshiper of Jesus Christ. And that relationship you have with him is more important than anything else else, including your happiness, your success, your dreams, and your desires. This is the idea of the fact that we have a king and a kingdom, a king who we submit to and say yes to and live under the authority of his kingdom. Do you know from the days right after Jesus' resurrection, the confession of Christians was something where they said to one another a phrase, a Greek phrase, and they would say the words Christos Kyrios. And that phrase is simple, and all it means is Jesus is Lord. Christ is Lord, or Master. And it was the phrase they used to say to one another. Kind of like on Easter Sunday morning when we gather together, if you're used to church, you have a background in church, we say, He is risen. What do you respond with? Yeah, they would do this in the early church. They would say, Christos Kyrios, and they'd say it to one another as a way to talk about that the Lord is that Christ is Lord over their lives. And this was more than any kind of statement of just saying, I'm just going to say this as rote memory. This meant something to them. And the reason why was because even in their culture, they had a saying. And around the time that Jesus uh, died and was resurrected unto new life and was raised and ascended unto heaven, there was a phrase in their culture that went something like this. It was Kaiser Kyrios, which meant Caesar is Lord. And so in some unique way, the Christians said, we're not going to live under the lordship of anyone else or the mastership of anyone else. We're going to live under the lordship of Jesus. And so they would go throughout their days saying, Christos Kyrios. And the early followers of Jesus learned a huge lesson in this whole process. And that was if you really followed Jesus and believed everything he says, it would change everything. It would change your entire life. You could no longer be casual about your belief. Jesus was different. There's something different about him. Now, fast forward to our context today, and I would honestly say to you that I don't think our context has changed too much today. For example, if you were to ask the normal everyday person walking along the streets, what is the biggest problem with Christ and or Christianity? I wonder what people would say. Like, if you were to think about this in your own minds, what do you think people on the streets would say? I I would love to hear some of your feedback, but we don't have a ton of time for that. I think probably one of the biggest roadblocks or biggest obstacles that people have when they think of Christ or Christianity is this issue of exclusivity, right? That Jesus is the only way, and that 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 the claims that Jesus made are such that if we don't believe them, that there are consequences, in fact, eternal consequences, to not believing those things. And so if we think of this idea of exclusivity, we think, oh, that's kind of, that doesn't fit our modern minds or modern culture very well. Because we like the idea of this hodgepodge that that all religions have good in them, that all religious beliefs somehow lead to heaven. And that if you just believe in, in a goodness of humanity or that there's a creator God, that somehow you'll make it. You'll be okay. Like as if you're, you know, you're not in the lowest 10% of the human population in your goodness and the things that you do that you might make it into heaven. But I think Jesus says things different than that. It's kind of like if you're hiking through the woods with a group of friends, right? And you all of a sudden have a bear that's going to start chasing you. You don't actually have to be faster than the bear, right? You just have to be faster than the slowest person in your group, right? You'll be fine. It's kind of like that's the way people think about religious thought. If I'm just better than most or one or two, then I'll make it in. But what if Jesus' claims are different than that? What if his exclusivity is actually good news for us? 
What if it's good news for you and for me and for everyone in the world? Like if we can change our paradigm a little bit to think that it's not keeping people out of heaven, but it's making Jesus unique enough that he's compelling to follow, that there's something about his exclusivity that makes us say, yeah, I get that. I want that. I desire that. Because others think that God graves on a curve, I think that people want all religions to be the same. But when Jesus shows up and starts his public ministry, all the people who wanted these religious categories to lead to the same place were completely blown away. They didn't understand what Jesus did. And when he started speaking, they realized, this is different. Jesus is different. He's different than any other God. He's different than any other religious authority out there. He's just different. And I think that's good news. Now, why do I think this is good news? Why do I think it's good news? Because of what we see that happens in Jesus' ministry in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark. And I want to read to you today just a chunk of Mark chapter 2, and we'll talk about this today. We'll talk about reasons why I think that Jesus' difference is actually good news for us. It's good news because he offers us various things. Number one, he offers us forgiveness is one thing he offers us. That, that Jesus himself is a God who come to offer people forgiveness. That he also calls sinners and not the self-sufficient to follow him as well, is the other thing we'll see in Mark 2. And finally, he also redefines all the religious rules. These are what we're going to see in Mark 2 today. Things that actually become good news for us if we think about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. You'll actually want him to be different, I hope, by the time we finish what happens in Mark chapter 2. Let's read together Mark 2 verses 1 through 12. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. We'll have the words on the screens behind us as well, and you get a chance to follow along, and we'll see what the Bible says about this different Lord, King, and Savior that has come to save us. And when Jesus, or when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Verse 6. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Isn't that the truth? Here they are seeing a man, a house being torn open and and friends who let down a paralytic into the room where Jesus was, where there was only standing room. And they go there and Jesus says something super compelling, but kind of misses the point in some ways, right? Like they're trying to get him healed and Jesus looks at him and says, your your sins are forgiven. And hang on, Jesus, we, we were we were trying to get him healed. That was our goal today. And, and then all of a sudden, everything gets questioned. All these people start wondering, like, what is Jesus doing? Why, why is he healing a person? How can he, or why does he say he can forgive a person? Like, we're here to see the show, the religious show, the cool thing where Jesus heals people and casts out demons that we read about in Mark chapter 1. But here Jesus claims something completely different and it seems like kind of an adventure and missing the point, really. If you were here in Mark chapter 1, for last week, Jesus' authority was recognized by everyone. But here in Mark chapter 2, suddenly Jesus' authority is being questioned by everyone. But the thing we actually see here is something unique. And one of the reasons that the exclusivity of Christ is so important for us, and that's this. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. He has the authority to do this. In fact, it's probably even more important than the person's paralysis that he's dealing with. 
than the fact that this person can't walk, can't help himself, can't care for himself. The biggest need that Jesus sees in that moment is this person is actually paralyzed by his sin, by his guilt, and by the shame that he faces. And so he says to them, son, your, your sins, they're forgiven. Might I propose to you today that Jesus has been sent primarily to offer himself as a substitute for the purpose of bringing forgiveness to, to you and to me, to our sinful world. And I want to camp out on this for a while today because I think this is one of the clearest reasons that Jesus is different. That he actually offers us something different than other religions. And I would even argue that this is the best news that you can ever hear today about why Jesus is so different and because that he can offer forgiveness. This is illustrated so well in the story of the paralytic. Let's break it down a little bit here. In Mark's gospel, we get a chance to hear a lot about the crowds. They represent the large numbers of people that follow him everywhere. And from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he starts healing people and casting out demons, we see the crowds follow him on a regular basis. They wonder what's going to happen because the man is compelling. And they represent these large numbers of people that show up wherever Jesus goes. And so they find out that Jesus goes to a house, his house, or maybe it's Peter's mother-in-law's house. We're not sure exactly where he goes in this process, but he's at home and he's there doing ministry and everyone shows up. And it's the crowd. They're so loud, that, so large, so many people that have prevented these four men from bringing their paralyzed friend to be healed. So out of desperation, they, they figure they can dig a hole in the ceiling. I'm not sure what kind of idea this came in. I'm not sure if one of the guys was like, ding, I got it, guys. We can rip the roof open and bring the paralytic through, right? I'm sure this was good news to everyone except the homeowner who was sitting there wondering, I wonder if there's like Messiah coverage in my homeowner's insurance to see if this will be okay. I'm not sure. There's insurance agents in here, and I'm not sure if they would know if that would happen or not. But the truth is, I think everyone's going, what? what how do we get Jesus to see our friend? How do we get our paralytic man to go and see him so he can be healed? Jesus does see him, in fact, and he looks at him and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. In the Greek, the word here is literally child. It's this nice phrase to a person to actually not not show some sort of superiority over him, but rather kind of a familiar relationship, a family relationship. And he says, child, my, my child, your sins are forgiven. He looks at this man and kind of knows him immediately. And then he claims that he can forgive the sins, that he has the authority to do that. The interesting thing in this is that all the people around him are kind of wondering, why, why did he go there? Why did Jesus go to forgiveness immediately? Because we are just here again to see all the things that were happening with Jesus as the Lord and King to, to make sure that people are healed and feeling better and all that kind of stuff. But Mark does something pretty cool here with the stories that he tells. I want to give you a nerd moment in the Gospel of Mark that we're going to see about 12 more times throughout the Gospel of Mark. Scholars call this a Markan sandwich, which is kind of funny. And what Mark does in his writing is he tends to tell a story, he takes a break in the middle of the story, and then he finishes telling the story afterwards. And the reason he does this is because he wants people to understand that in the middle of what that is, is the point of the actual story. And so Mark does it in this moment where he talks about the the sandwich here is the healing of the paralytic in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, or 1 through 5a. And then he talks about that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins in Mark 2, 5b through 10a. And then he goes right back to healing the paralytic again in 2.10 through 12. And the sandwich, or the, the toothpick, I've heard it said in some of the, uh, you know, if you can picture a sandwich, the thing that holds it together is this cue in 2.5 and 2.10 where he says, he says to the paralytic and he says to the paralytic. And he, he does this. He d- he'll do this about 12 times in the Gospel of Mark. And in the middle of this thing is this idea, this B part where it says that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. See, the interesting thing is the story is not about the healing of the paralytic after all. The story is actually about forgiveness. That's what the whole story is about. That's what makes Jesus unique, is that he has the authority to do that. And the reason why is Mark wants to highlight this by linking these stories together, that Jesus does have this uniqueness, that he is different than all of the other religious leaders that are out there. Now, in their culture, this guy would have been told that he is guilty of some sin. I don't know if you know this or not, but when people had a sin or deformity or some brokenness in their life, when when the other people could see 
Everything was religious in their culture. Everything was traced back to a God who was punishing them for something they had done wrong. And so when this man who's paralyzed, who can't walk, who maybe can't use his arms or anything like that, is dealing with this sickness, everyone goes to the fact that he must have done something really wrong because he's completely paralyzed. He doesn't just have like a hurt arm or a deformity or something like that, but this man is completely paralyzed. It's almost like he's wearing an A-board sign that says that I am guilty of some heinous sin. So in the middle of this story, we get this sandwich, and Jesus says to him, I have the authority to forgive you of all your sins. That it's, it's not your paralysis that's causing you to have a non-relationship with me or make you unclean before me according to Old Testament laws. It's rather that you need forgiveness. And this raises just a huge ruckus. Now Mark likes to question, use questions to prompt the readers. So he tells us here that the scribes or the teachers of the law say, who can forgive sins except God alone? In Mark 2.7. And then without skipping a beat, or literally it says immediately, because Mark likes to use that word again, to not let a good teachable moment pass, Jesus affirms their suspicion, says the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins in Mark 2.10. The Mark and Sandwich finishes when it says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Because it's more than just physical healing. There's something about this. There's something amazing about this. I want to pause here a minute and talk about forgiveness. I want to talk about the idea of what it means to be forgiven of our sins because it's so important. It's something that's the foundation, the bedrock, if you will, of the Christian faith. It's something that, that you need to understand if you know Jesus today. It's something that can set you free today to know that, that you can walk out of here in complete newness of life and experience the forgiveness. That, that maybe you're kind of like the paralytic today, that you wandered in here with a desire to have something in your life fixed. Like, like if I can just get past this thing, then I'll be okay. If I can just be fixed for this one addictive thing in my life, then, then I'll be okay. The interesting thing is when the paralytic comes to Jesus, he thinks he's going to take care of one need, but he actually takes care of a deeper need. And that deeper need is that need for forgiveness. There are so many implications in this passage today that Jesus has the authority and the power to forgive your sins. That your expectations coming in here may be different. That you may think you come in here with some, some desire for Jesus to help bless you or do something for you. Or, or maybe you think if you show up to church today, then things will go okay this week. And I, and I think the text confronts, confronts us with this idea. That you know what's more important than that? More important than even healing or, or anything like that is forgiveness. Forgiveness is an amazing word. I believe it's the best gift we've ever been given by Jesus Christ. It means your debt has been discharged. Your guilt is gone. Your conscience is clean. Your past pardoned. And your record is removed. Jesus, as God, has the power to remove your sins and he can take your guilt away. So have you ever felt guilty? Have you ever felt that? It feels terrible, doesn't it? Don't you dwell on it? What keeps replaying in your mind? You're filled with regrets and you think to yourself, if only I would have done this differently. If only I would have not made that choice, then I wouldn't be dealing with the guilt and the shame of this thing. I wonder if some level, if the paralytic kind of felt like that, being brought before everyone, because there's no way the crowd missed the hole in the roof happening. Everyone sees him. Everything's on display. Isn't guilt kind of like that? You kind of feel that way. Everyone's kind of looking. Everyone knows. Or, or maybe your sin has been found out and that people looking at you know that you have some guilt in your life, some bit of shame. So the question becomes, how do you, how do you deal with that guilt? What do you do with that? I think there's several ways that we as people try to deal with guilt. I think one of the ways is that we say we just flat out deny we're guilty. We flat out say, I'm not guilty. It's okay. I, I mean, I'm going to throw off my old antiquated standards of morality and I'm going to live how I want to live because I'm just not guilty. It's just not the case anymore. I don't want to be guilty. I don't want to feel that way. We also just try to be better. We just try to do things better. I'm never going to look at those explicit pictures again. I'm just not going to do it. It's like the New Year's resolution to dealing with guilt. Every time you do something, you break some rule, you do something you're not supposed to, you say you're going to try to be better. Better. Maybe you compare yourself to others. Maybe you say, I, 
I may get angry, but at least I'm not like the guy who hits his wife. I'm not that bad. I may yell at people on the freeway, and I may flip them off, but at least I don't drive and crash into their car like some of those people out there do. I'm not that bad. We compare ourselves with other people. Or maybe we do something different. Maybe we actually obsess over our guilt. I failed again. I keep breaking things. How can I approach God? How can I ever be accepted by him? Many of us obsess so much over our guilt that we fall into depression, that we deal with mental illness of sorts because we haven't taken care of the guilt and shame in our life. But what's the right way to deal with guilt? If these are some of the the bad ways that we deal with guilt, what is the right way? The Bible actually says that our guilt is real. The Bible says that this man who came before Jesus as paralytic had sin in his life. It's not because of the, it's not the paralysis that caused the sin or the sin that caused the paralysis, but there's something here that the Bible says our guilt is real. When Jesus says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. The reality is there is a God who requires perfection from us, who created us. However, none of us are perfect. So if you struggle with guilt, you're in great company today. Welcome to the club. We could almost call it the we're broken club. (laughs) The we need forgiveness club that we deal with guilt and shame. So we recognize that we are guilty, but that God himself can set us free from our sin and our shame. Jesus came and died in our place. He was a substitute because he was without sin. And his death means that we can be reconciled to God and we can receive his forgiveness today. I would say this, Jesus is the only real answer to our guilt. So I think if we come in here today with this sense of guilt and shame and brokenness, that you can approach Jesus and say, I, I need forgiveness for that. I need forgiveness from you. And the answer is, the Son of Man has the authority to offer you that forgiveness. No one else does. You can't appease God enough. You can't do enough good things to receive forgiveness. You can't do anything in here to help you receive forgiveness except God alone. Jesus who gives you forgiveness. He has the authority to do that. I had a friend several years ago that I had the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with. This man had a really tough life. At at one point, he was a successful business banker, married with kids, and, and had a fairly good life. But through his own choices of alcoholism, sexual sins during his marriage, and wasting all his money, not the least of which on gambling, he ended up at a rehab center where I met him one day. He was raised Catholic, so in order to be saved, or he thought in order to be saved, he thought God would reward people with heaven if they did good things and punish the ones who didn't do enough good things with hell. Moreover, he thought he had to go to church in order to receive forgiveness and justification. And here's the thing. He was so caught up in the guilt and shame of his life and the things that he did that he couldn't get over it. And he knew, because I was in ministry, that I, that I had this kind of priestly function. He looked at me, he goes, can I confess all my sins to you? I'm like, I guess so. You know, I didn't really know what to expect in this. He goes, I I just need to confess all my sins. Like, I'm so broken. You don't realize all the guilt I'm dealing with on a regular basis. This man had had years of baggage that was piling up in his life, and it was overcoming him, so much so that he was homeless, on the streets, now in a rehab center, trying to get clean. And he looks at me, a man named Alan. He said, can I confess my sins to you? I said, all right, go ahead. So Alan sat there and he started to confess his sins to me. And I tell you what, he started talking in great detail about some of the sins. I was, and I was like, whoa, this is, this is getting weird, Alan. You don't, need to, you don't need to share this stuff. He's like, no, no, I feel better. And I'm like, no, no, I feel worse. Please stop, you know. Like, don't, don't confess all these sins. And I remember at one point during this time, I could see him. Kind of this, this shame was being lifted off him. And I said, Alan, have you ever read the book of Hebrews? Have you ever said, read what it said about forgiveness and what Jesus does for us? And I said, it says that Jesus made it possible to, be, to forgive us, and he's the only priest that you'll ever need. You don't need to confess these sins to me. You confess them to him, and you can be healed. It says that in Hebrews chapter 4. Moreover, he's the once and for all sacrifice. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, I believe, where, where Jesus is the one who is given for us, that you can confess your sins to be forgiven right now. And Alan looked at me, he goes, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm a professional, trust me, you know. And here I watched Alan just with this sense of like, oh my gosh, I I need to get rid of the garbage, the sin that's inside me. That's why Christianity is such good news. Do you know that? That's why Christianity is good news. That's why you can come before the Lord this morning and you might bring your random needs here, 
You might feel like you're bringing stuff like the paralytic did. You might even have your friend dragging you like the paralytic's friend, friend bringing you to church so you can hear the good news. And you might think you have some expectation of what's going to happen here. I think the word that Jesus would have for you today is that I can forgive you of all of your sins. Will you meditate on some verses with me for just a second? I want to read these to you. You might even consider closing your eyes to hear these words. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Micah 7, 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. What a great image. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Isaiah 43, verse 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the good news. This is why Jesus is different. This is why the exclusivity of Christ is the best news you'll ever hear because he has the authority to forgive you for your sins and your brokenness. He offers guilt cleansing. Once you become a Christian, you don't stop sinning, but you have a way to deal with that guilt now. You have a way to turn to your great high priest who is there with you, who wants to receive your brokenness and trade back to you his righteousness. That's the picture of forgiveness we have. As we continue on this story, we actually see something amazing. I only got a couple more minutes left, but I want to read one more chunk just to show you that if you're a person who feels still that you don't have the authority or you don't have the ability to receive the forgiveness from God, let me show you what happens right after this story of forgiveness because Jesus does something amazing, and that's that he calls sinners and not the self-sufficient. Let's look at this in Mark 2, 13 through 17. So Jesus went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Because I came not to call the righteous, but I came to call the sinners. You see how I said a minute ago, if you don't feel like you deserve the the grace, the forgiveness, the, the release from guilt that you can join the brokenness club and we can all say together, yes, I, I, I can receive that. This is the greatest story of that. Because here Jesus shows up and says, I have the authority to forgive sins, but I'm also here to save the sinner, to reach out to those who are broken, not to those who are self-sufficient, not to those who think they can make it on their own. The interesting thing about tax collectors in the ancient culture is that these people were cursed in society. In fact, Matthew, Levi, was the worst of the worst. There were certain tax collectors in their society who would collect normal stuff, like property taxes and some of those things. But then there was another brand of tax collectors in their day who would require duties from everyone. They'd go along, and if a person's walking along the road and they had too many bags on their donkey, they would charge them for that. They had various things that these tax collectors would do, and this was Levi. In fact, even the picture we have, who was sitting in his tax collector booth, he was collecting tolls for people to walk on the road, like on a public road, and he would take all this money and he would send it back to Rome. He was kind of working for the enemy in that way. This man was hated. What did Jesus do to him? Walks up to him and says, you follow me. I want you. And then the most crazy thing happens is that Matthew, Levi, decides to have a party in his house, invites all his heinous tax-collecting friends to come and be a part of this party. 
and all the religious people are going, what in the world is going on here? What is Jesus doing? They recognized that he was different, that there was something about him, that he was calling the wicked people, the unrighteous people, to follow him. Jesus calls this man into his band of disciples and apostles. So let me ask you this. Do you feel like an outcast today? Like a religious failure in some way, shape, or form? The good news of the gospel is that you can be in. You don't have to feel like an outcast around here. You don't have to feel like a religious failure. In fact, your job this morning is to come before the Lord and to lay your sins before him, to come and repent of those things, to say to the Lord, I, I, I need forgiveness. I, I want to be like that paralytic. I want to have my sins forgiven. I can get out and, and walk out in freedom and newness of life. And that's the good news of the gospel today. That's why I think the exclusivity of Jesus Christ is so important because he didn't come just to make righteous people better. He came to make dead people alive. He came to make you and me followers of him, even though we're broken, people who need forgiveness, people who need our shame and guilt dealt with. It's beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing. We're going to turn to the Lord in response today. I love how Jesus didn't turn or shy away from controversy here. This whole chapter is kind of fraught with controversy. I mean, he's offering forgiveness to a person who didn't look like he should be forgiven. He's eating with sinners. I mean, even as we get to the second half of the chapter, which we'll not be able to look at today, I would love for you to read. He actually questions the fasting and and the breaking of the Sabbath that the religious people are doing. And he points to the fact that he's coming to call sinners, not the righteous, to repentance. He's coming to call people like you and me. This is good news for you. You don't need to clean up your act to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You simply need to come before him and humbly submit yourself to him this morning and say, I I need you. I need you, Lord. In just a minute here, we're going to sing some more songs and invite the worship team to come back up. And, And as we sing these songs, this is my encouragement to you today. Would you fall on the forgiveness of Jesus? Would you fall on his authority to give you forgiveness, to offer you that in an amazing way that this morning you can walk out of here cleansed of your guilt, your shame, and all the things that you're dealing with, you can do that. Every single one of us can do that. And as we sing these songs, you're welcome to sing with us. You're welcome to just sit there and listen. You can pray quietly. Also during this time, you're welcome to pray. You can pray in your seat. You can get up. You can wander around anywhere in our building here. There are going to be people in the back who are wearing prayer tags if you need prayer for anything. Maybe you're a person that feels like you still need to confess some of these things. Like my friend Alan who needed to confess some of his sins. And, and I watched literally the life come back to him as he shared some of those things. Maybe you need to share some of these things with people today. You're welcome to go back and pray with any of those people. You're also welcome to come up and receive communion on both our tables up here. You can come up and receive communion. There's bread and a cup. And there's gluten-free option on this table over here. You can come and you can take the bread and you can dip it in the cup. And you can receive communion right there at the table. You can wander back to your seats. You can be in anywhere in the auditorium here and receive his forgiveness. Maybe that's your act this morning of faith to come before him and say, Lord, I, I need your forgiveness. I, I don't want to be self-sufficient anymore. I don't want to try to deal with guilt and shame my own way. I want to come to you, Lord, and receive that. And then finally, there's also baskets up here for our offering, and you're welcome at any point to come and give. And we're so thankful for what you give to Imprint Church as as we're doing ministry here, and and God has lots of things in the future for us, which I'm very excited about. If you're a guest, please drop your guest card in there. We'll send you a gift this week as a way to thank you for being here. But would you allow God to take care of your guilt and shame today? Would you allow him to offer you that forgiveness, the same type of forgiveness? Maybe you should come to him the same way that Matthew, that Levi came to him, in the same way that the paralytic's friends brought Jesus with expectation that he can do something this morning and that he actually wants to do something as well. Would you pray with me about these things? God, I'm grateful for your words. God, I'm grateful that you offer us life through these words. And God, I I would ask that you would help us to receive your forgiveness this morning. Lord, I I know that there's people in here that are dealing with guilt and shame from whatever it is, from maybe bad choices they made this week, maybe bad choices, heck, that we made this morning. Lord, I pray that you would offer us the forgiveness that we need, that we might walk out with a sense of of being able to follow you and with the, the power of the Spirit working on us, and ultimately that we'd rest upon you, that we don't have to be righteous, we don't have to clean up our act to come before you, but that, Lord, that you give us hope, you give us life, right now, no matter where we're at. Thanks for that, Lord.
Lord, would you speak to us? Would you draw us near as we receive communion together? Would you help us worship you completely for the goodness, for the exclusivity of what you offer us in forgiveness and the authority that you have to forgive our sins in that way? So Lord, we trust you. We commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.